Hi, I'm Carrie Toth, and I wanted to talk to you a little bit today about assessing with finesse. I'm a National Board Certified Teacher. I teach in rural Southern Illinois. In 2013, I was the Illinois State Language Teacher of the Year. In 2014, I was selected as the Central States Language Teacher of the Year. And in November of 2014, I got to stand on the stage at ACTFL with four other teachers as one of the finalists for the ACTFL National Language Teacher of the Year. And that was a journey that was um, kind of difficult for me because in 2005, I failed the national board process. I did not achieve in my first round of uh, national board entry. And the truth is that that was probably the best thing that has ever happened to me teaching career wise, because it made me really stop and reflect on what I was doing in the classroom. And as I started to reflect on what I was doing, I began to make changes. And those changes have led to the accomplishments that I have in my current career. So we're going to talk a little about assessing with finesse, but it all comes back to me, to this uh, architecture of accomplished teaching that uh, is part of the national board process. And uh, in the national board, you talk about the five core propositions, like the five key things to being uh, a national board quality certified teacher. Um, and that is that we're committed to our students and their learning. Uh, we know our subject and that we know how to teach it, that we know how to monitor student learning through assessment, uh, that we really think about our practice and learn from experience. And that maybe is where I was failing on a pretty high level and that we become members of learning communities. So as I look at this architecture of accomplished teaching, what I see is that the number one is to uh, know your students. Who are they? Where are they now? What do they need? What do I need to do to get them there? Where should I begin? Um, as language teachers, nothing can be more important to us than knowing those students, that knowing where they are, uh, knowing who they are, knowing what interests them. This is what get people gets uh, people, gets our students excited about learning from us. Also, we need to be able to set high worthwhile goals for these students at this time. But the thing is that they have to be appropriate goals. And I think that there was a time when I was setting my goal at perfection, and that's not what language students can do. We need to implement instruction that is designed to attain those goals. I was just teaching kind of from the beginning of the chapter to the end of the chapter in the textbook, and I wasn't really taking into account what instruction would help my students attain the goals that they had for themselves. Uh, our fourth little step here goes back to being responsible for monitoring student learning. We evaluate them, but in light of our goals and instruction, and since I didn't necessarily have a goal other than to finish chapter two, I wasn't maybe evaluating them on whether or not they had achieved the goal because it was just to finish the chapter. Um, so we have to really think about what our goals are. And then this fifth one, really thinking systematically, I totally derailed right here, reflecting on student learning, the effectiveness of our instructional design, our concerns. I almost feel like I used to put the blame on the student. If they didn't do well on an assessment, I made excuses like the student is not a good memorizer or the student is not a good speller. But the truth is maybe I was just approaching how I assessed wrong and how I designed instruction to that assessment wrong. And then the sixth one is to set new high worthwhile goals. And sometimes that goal might include some reteaching of something that they were not successful on in the last unit. What we have to remember about assessment is that it's just a snapshot in time. Uh, one assessment can't tell us the proficiency of a student, that it's just a performance that they've done. So it does not reflect overall how talented they are in language, how fast they learn. An assessment is an opportunity for growth. Every time we assess, we have the option of letting them try to show us growth. So if it's an opportunity for growth, that might mean that I have to consider the possibility of offering them um, redos or retakes. What is What would I want them to do before I let them retake this assessment so that they really could show me that they've grown? 
it is part of the architecture of accomplished teaching. We do need to evaluate and see where our students are, but remember that another part is to know our students, uh, to know our content, to set really great worthwhile goals. So I think assessment gets to become very prominent in the forefront of what we're doing, but we have to consider it as part of a package of accomplished teaching. Assessment is different for every student in our classroom. I can't hold everyone to the same standard on a certain assessment because students all process differently. Uh, in my own you know, child raising, I've seen that my two children process things differently and they, but my daughter spoke complete sentences very early. My son didn't, but my son was able to identify like numbers. He could read numbers from the time he was about 11 months old, he would read the checkout numbers at Walmart, but he wasn't talking to us in sentences uh, until a little later, like his speech development was a little later. So we have to remember that our we can't compare one child to another because they all eventually learn to speak and speak well. It's just that it sometimes takes a little more time for some. And assessment to me is probably the biggest stress for educators. And so maybe we can take a little of that stress out as we go through um, what it takes to assess with finesse. And one thing it does not take is weighing the pig more often. If I weigh the pig at the beginning of September and then mid-September and then the end of September, I'm not going to see a whole lot of growth in my pig. If I weigh my pig at the beginning of September and then again mid-October, now I have a little bit more um, growth that I can show in my pig. And it gives me a lot of extra time. If I weigh my pig, sorry about all these text messages popping in. I didn't think about uh, shutting all that stuff down uh, before I logged in to do this presentation. Uh, we have a lot more free time. If we don't have to weigh the pig every week or every two weeks, weighing the pig being a, a summative type of assessment that requires us to do a little more heavy duty grading, uh, then that means that we have less stress. And that's kind of a key factor. We talk about, you know, maybe having some time for me or some time to de-stress or some good mental health breaks. And if you're assessing constantly and grading constantly, you're not getting those great mental health breaks that you need. One of the things I want you to consider as we talk about cutting the strings on grading and assessing is that really, and this uh, is data from a survey by Lister and Ranta in 1997, but the same has held true in many, many modern surveys. And sometimes uh, the data is even more grim about feedback that really it doesn't do anything to help them student generate repairs. But if you look at it recasting, all the times that a student says something, we say, oh, yes, you're right, it was. And then we say it the right way. It has zero effect on student generated repairs. And what it mainly does to recast is to let students know that you caught their error and that you noticed it and that you're correcting them. Um, elicitation actually has the highest level of student generated repairs where they make the correction automatically themselves. So did you mean has? And then to let them say, oh, no, 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 wants. Uh, that's got the highest of student generated repairs. What I really wanted to point out, though, was explicit correction, going through and explicitly correcting errors has a zero student generated repair. Um, so what that means is that if we spend six hours grading essays and checking every verb ending, every noun adjective agreement, every spelling error, every accent, and we're getting zero student generated repairs out of that, we've really wasted our time. Like we need to find a way to do this better. Uh, so maybe feedback becomes less about going through and finding everything a student did wrong. Maybe it becomes more about finding some things that a student did very well and marking those, and then choosing a thing. Um, this is a Spanish for student and they're continually using apostrophe S, which doesn't exist in Spanish. So maybe at, a, at that level, then I say, don't forget apostrophe S doesn't exist in Spanish. We say blah, 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 day, blah, blah, blah. Now it's one targeted thing that a student can think about and hopefully 
then self-generate the repairs. But when it's a whole mess of stuff that is all corrections on their paper, we're not really giving them any specific feedback for how to grow. We can't equate assessment to testing. What we're thinking as assessment can't just be like end of chapter tests in our mind, end of unit test. Assessment is really an ongoing process. It's the way we do business, constantly monitoring student development and the outcomes of our educational activity. Found this quote online, thought it was great because it's the truth. We just are in a constant state of evaluating the outcomes of our educational activity. That means if I'm not seeing good results on formatives, then what I'm giving them educationally maybe isn't quite enough and I need to reevaluate that. So first step is to know your students. And I know that my students do best when I change environments a lot. When students are sitting in the same chair all day long, you know, moving class to class, just sitting in their chair, uh, their attention starts to veer a little bit. When I let them move around inside my classroom, that's one of the ways that my assessments become more productive for me. So we do a lot of times where we move our assessment to the floor. Uh, this type of assessment is actually something I call circle the wagons. I do this as a formative assessment. I don't require everybody to participate. It is a completion grade. Even if you don't say a word, if you are actively involved in the discussion with your eyes and your mannerisms and you're laughing in the right places and this we sit in a circle so this is very easy for me to see that everyone is involved then you get full credit so basically what i'm trying to do is elicit before our summative assessment where i want students to write or speak about something with good details I'm going to use the same images or the same screenshots from a video or illustrations from a reader. I'm going to have the students sit in a circle with those images in the center. And one by one, they can pick up any image that they want to and make a statement about it. Their classmates will ask a couple follow-up questions. So uh, this was during a unit that I got from Nellie Hughes. Um, it's called The Picture is Worth a Thousand Words. And we looked at the photo arc photos from National Geographic and Joel Sartori. And I had the students describe the animals. Well, the first instinct is just describe the colors, uh, describe what animal it is. But as more and more students want to go and want to talk uh, in the circle, they have to come up with more and more details about what they see. So now they're evaluating the emotions of the animal or the actions that the animal is doing in the picture or something that they remember from our discussion about that particular animal. Um, so having them on the floor i know that these students like that hands-on grabbing the different manipulatives they like being able to see each other they like the change in scenery and seating so this little formative assessment lets me evaluate whether they're getting good at adding details or if we need to talk more about the images and it also lets them kind of honors their learning style of needing the brain break of moving to a new place I also like when I assess to allow students choice and voice, and I would encourage you to do the same. An assessment can, can be a choice board. So for example, if I'm in a level one class and we're at the end of the school year and we've read a reader, my students are ready to produce. They are ready to either speak or write about that reader. They've had lots of input at this point. So I'm gonna ask them, choose a topic. It doesn't matter to me which one, they feel like they have a choice and that makes this assessment. It really does two things. It makes them more invested in the assessment because they got to pick what they wanted to write about or speak about, but it also makes it easier for me because now I'm not reading the exact same assessment 60 to 80 times. Now I get to read different viewpoints and different takes on that same assessment. So who was your favorite character and why? What was the most dramatic part of the story? Retell the story in as much detail as possible. I don't know if you noticed, but I tried to go into some higher order thinking. For the student who is really just getting by, their proficiency is developing kind of at a slower pace or maybe right on track with what uh, level one proficiency so should look like. They may want to just retell the story because that's all facts and information that they already have. But those students that are really starting to float above the rest of the crowd, 
uh, they may want to show what they know. And a lot of times they do. And so they'll pick who was your favorite character and why, or what was the most dramatic part of the story, because they are already feeling in their head like they have the language to express those things. So it lets me differentiate a little to use a choice board. I also like to let them choose a medium because honestly, the amount of text that they're going to include is the same. It just lets them produce it in a way that feels comfortable and less threatening. If I tell everybody we have to write an essay, then the ones that feel like it's hard to write an essay in English are going to be scared. But if I tell them they can make it a children's book, then that makes them feel like, oh. so I tell them. If you're going to allow them the choice of a children's book or a comic or anything that has art in it, you need to be sure and say you have six minutes or whatever your time is to get your illustrations done. And the rest of the time should be devoted to writing because otherwise they'll spend the whole class period drawing and that's not what you're evaluating. So make a children's book, write an essay, write a play, write a book review, write a blog post. Just give them a ton of ways that they can choose from to express who their favorite character was or uh, the summary of the book. This is an example from one of my level three students. And this is an example of the very top. And I wanted to put this in here just so that I could tell you I take this student every time I do a grade. This was one where they could choose the topic of their blog post and everybody was doing a blog post, but they had a lot of different choices of how to express themselves within that blog post. This is a level three mid-year student. I can't read hers first and then grade the rest of the class because it sets an unrealistic bar for everybody else. So what I do is pull hers out immediately. Put it at the bottom of the stack. That's the last essay that I'm going to read. I'm going to pull out the middle first. I like to pull out the middle. The people that I know are strongly in the middle of development in their language skills. Because what that lets me do is if this is where the middle, the majority of the class is falling, then I know what feedback to give someone who didn't quite come up to that middle level. And I also know what feedback to give someone that went beyond that level. So if the middle is doing all sentences, all using connecting words, then I need to tell my ones that didn't quite get to that sentences connected with connecting words. Maybe next time, if you could use some transitions, you'd really move into that intermediate category. Or if they've been using in the middle sentences and transition words, but then I have these students who have used paragraphs and who have used things like por supuesto, of course, in Spanish. Those are the things I can say, you did an incredible introduction. Wow, this is really incredible vocabulary. Um, Fish in the ocean live with an antagonist, an antagonista every day. Uh, we do this kind of circle discussion called Discussion Thursday when we're reading or when we're doing units. And we talk a lot about protagonists and antagonists. And so she's pulled this vocabulary word in from previous discussions. So those are the kinds of things I want to highlight in these superstar students, high flyers. So just be sure you're setting realistic expectations, not only for them, but for yourself. Uh, don't want to set the expectation that all your students are going to be like that one. Um, you want to set the expectation that at novice level, this is what they're able to do. And I'm going to be sure that I grade them with that expectation in mind. And it helps to know the actual proficiency descriptors as you do that. Um, I'm not only familiar with them, I keep them on the wall of my classroom. And as I go through the um, school year, I just point. Um, if we are at novice high right now, I'm going to point to the novice high and I'm going to say, this is what that looks like. Uh, you're making complete sentences. You're making actually um, not super detailed, but really good, solid sentences now uh, to communicate your meaning. But if you want to move up to the next level, now you're going to connect those sentences and they're going to sound a little smoother instead of there's a boy, there's a tall boy, there's a boy in the classroom. You'd say there is a tall boy in the classroom and he so the sentences start to look a little different as you become an intermediate so just having those those descriptors there will help you tell your students what to expect and what you expect from them in their assessment 
I, one thing that I think is really interesting is if I'm asking students on my assessment, if I want them to evaluate and create, which is what I'm doing and asking them to make a blog post or asking them to, uh, you know, give me an elevator pitch about why we shouldn't use plastics, single use plastics, but our instruction only asks that they remember and comprehend. So understanding conjugations or remembering vocabulary, we've taken a wrong direction. So we need to be sure that our instruction is not focused only on remembering words or understanding some grammar concept. It has to really be a constant state of evaluation and creation with language together in the classroom so that we'll be able to lead them to success on our assessment. I want to encourage you to, as you assess and you assess with finesse and you're trying to take some of the pressure off yourself to grade smarter, not harder, I do a lot of completion grades. And the truth is that in our classroom, probably a good hefty chunk should just be completion grades because this goes back to that architecture of accomplished teaching. If I've done a story with my students in class today and we're, you know, we've told a story to kind of establish the vocabulary for the unit that we're studying. And at the end of the class period, I give them five questions about this story using these key words that I've just worked with them. And most of the class gets three out of five. What does that tell me? That tells me that they really haven't internalized those structures. So what I do is give them a completion grade of five out of five for everybody. And then I take that three out of five information internally to help me decide that tomorrow we need to go back and we need to retell the story and use those same structures. And maybe I even need to ask them some more personalized questions using those structures so that when we end the day today, I can give them a little bit different exit ticket and just check to see if they're sticking better. Because if I never do those little formative evaluations to see if they're understanding, I may get to the end of the unit and find that they can't use any of the structures to communicate meaning. So don't be afraid of that type of just five out of five point grade. When I put that in the grade book, um, I do my exit tickets at five points. I probably do two a week of some kind of little formative five point grade. So in a nine week period, that gives me maybe 90 points. But also in a nine week period, I'm probably going to complete three to four units of study where I would have a little bigger summative assessment. In a one week unit of study, my summative is maybe going to be a 10 point summative grade. Uh, but in a two to three week unit of study, it might be anywhere from 25 to 40 points for the summative assessment. So what that means is that at the end of the quarter, I'm still going to have more or at least even in summative assessments. But the formatives help them if maybe a student is really strong at listening and paying attention in class and they uh, can do well on any type of interpretive summative assessment, but when it comes time to produce, they're a little behind the rest of the class, that student doesn't deserve to be an F student. They are still learning and growing every day. And that's maybe where I totally fell off the assessment wagon before. I was trying, you know, I had so many that got C's and D's and F's that by the time Spanish one was over, Spanish two was maybe 25% smaller. And then Spanish three was even 50% smaller than that. And Spanish four was sometimes six to 12 students. That's not good. We want students to feel success uh, because even if they aren't processing as high as other kids, as long as they're making progress in the right direction, they should probably be a B or a C student because what the data showed us, um, C-A-S-L-S -S is, I, I don't know if you know about the Carla Research Institute, uh, Language Center for Advanced Language Research. Um, when we when we look at the studies that these centers from, for advanced language research have done, and you can Google C-A-S-L-S, -S, University of Oregon, and it'll come up with the study that they did on anticipated proficiency after four years in a language program or with years of language study, I think it says. 
in that study, what they found, and this was done in 2010, so I hope that if they redo the study maybe in 2020, um, they'll find that the results are better because more teachers are becoming more committed to teaching for proficiency. But what they found in that study was that the majority, over half of students that have taken a four-year language program still score novice high and intermediate low on tests like the OPI, the Apple, the STAMP after four years of language study. So what that tells me, if the national average is that they can make basic sentences and even some of them can do sentences that are combined with transition words after four years, I was holding my students to way too high a bar. Uh, those students at novice high, intermediate, low have to be able to be understood by sympathetic listeners, language teachers, and not by native speakers. And so I was expecting perfection in level four. And so, you know, many couldn't live up to that bar. But if the realistic expectation is that 50% of students are still kind of at that intermediate, low uh, marker, then that means that they can make errors and that they can not be able to sustain paragraph level discourse. The ones that can do that are the anomalies. They're the superstars. They're the ones that get lots of feedback about what makes them so special or why don't you become a Spanish teacher or why don't you become a nurse that speaks Spanish? But I can't hold everybody up to that high of a standard because they just can't, not everybody's brain achieves language acquisition at the same rate. So. Thinking about it in those terms, it's okay to do summative assessments and have them be worth 90 points and then formative assessments be 90 points and have a lot of students that are making A's and B's in your class. Uh, it isn't that same old feeling that we, it had to be rigorous and we had to leave some behind because not everybody can learn language. If we continue down that path that we say not everyone can learn language, then we're going to continue to have a nation that doesn't value language acquisition. And that's not where we want to go at all. Um, so I do a lot of completion and exit tickets. They're your friend. Do five questions about the story you told in class. Make it worth five points. Give the five points to everybody. Unless, I mean, obviously there might be some kid that came in and slept through class today and you couldn't get them to wake up no matter how much you tried to involve them. Okay, that kid has gotten a zero. I still understand that outside my classroom there are a lot of factors that I have no control over. And this kid might be having an issue that has nothing to do with me. So if this kid comes to me later and says, man, yesterday I was having a really bad day. Is there any way I can retake that assessment? Heck yes, you can. I understand that your life has a lot of things I don't know about. But if this is a kid that is continually pushing your limits, you know, it's okay to say, no, you can't retake this until uh, we get on the same page of, I just want what's best for you. Uh, listen and draw. Sometimes I'll have them listen to me retell five scenes and draw them. This still shows comprehension. And it lets me see it actually, as you do listen and draw a little bit, you'll start to see the variations in what students are understanding. Uh, because the ones that understand a lot are going to draw very detailed story scenes. And the ones that only understand the basics will draw a little less. Make the story a comic. Sometimes I don't even do a retail at the end. I just give them, I keep a stack of papers with, they have basically a grid with six boxes, two, two, two uh, on the table. And I have them make a comic out of the story quickly at the end of the classroom and that a classroom class period. And that helps me know what they understood of the story that we've told today. So these are all ways for me to know if what I'm giving them is sticking. It's easy five point grades for me to put in the grade book. It's nothing I have to take home at night because I can quickly flip through these pages and see where students are and give them their five point completion. And I know where I need to go tomorrow. So please weigh your pig less often. Put the most valuable points at the end of the unit and just make the formative assessments for completion. When you get to the end, if you've used formative wisely, your students are ready to perform on their summative assessment. And so you're going to put in more valuable points, 25 or 30 points at the end of the unit. But they also are ready for that because they've shown you on a lot of formative assessments. You've taken that in and you've gone back and you've re, uh, reinforced the structures you've been working on and they're ready. Please avoid comparison. 
superstars are anomalies. My friend Christy Placido is the first person that I heard say that, and it really resonated with me because it's so easy in a classroom to get swept up into what that superstar can say and to just go down this path with them, forgetting that everybody else has totally lost what you're talking about. So honor them and give them the chance to perform. But also, and I'm going to tell you one of the ways that I do that with my superstars a little later, um, but just don't forget that they are, they're the exception to the rule and not to be swept up by them. When you're assessing, I want to encourage you to lean on interpretive assessments in lower levels. Dr. Krashen talks a little bit about the silent period. And while I don't think that that means that we have to be completely silent with our students, because our students want to be able to perform for us, um, they really want to show off what we know, what they know. Um, they also can't say things that they've never been exposed to. So at the lower levels, a lot of times, not being silent, producing for them involves me giving them an answer and them choosing it like which do you prefer this or this well they can they can definitely produce back this one or that one some of them really quickly can say where or why or how but not all um so i want to lean for them for assessment i want to lean heavier especially in the first semester of level one by second semester of level one, they're able to produce a little more as far as story retells, but still it should lean more heavily toward the interpretive in my opinion. So we can do listen and draws. Uh, I sometimes have them at the end of, if we've read a reader, I might tell a short parallel story out loud and they have to answer questions about it at the end. It's using the same structures that were in the reader but it's giving them a chance to do a little bit of an interpretive. And those questions, when I ask them, I ask them in English, because what's my goal? It's to check their comprehension, uh, their listening comprehension. And if I have the questions in Spanish, now they have to read and understand that question. If they misunderstand the question, I don't know if they misunderstood on the read or on the listen. So a very simple way to just be positive I'm evaluating the right thing is to give five little simple questions in English, tell them the story, have them answer. I also like to listen to a native speaker talk about a topic and answer questions. Um, when we're doing any kind of like a little reading or a cultural topic in Spanish too, we read my reader Bianca Nieves y los Siete Toritos. So I have my friend Nelly, who is a native speaker, she just recorded me a one minute little voice message on WhatsApp and I downloaded it and I play it for my students and it just tells what Nelly thinks about bullfights and I gave them five questions in English to answer about it. It's go to your native speaker friends because one thing that you'll find is that everybody wants other people to learn language. Um, if somebody comes to me and says, I'm teaching an English class and I wondered if you would record this, I love that, that there are students of English that want to hear a native English speaker. Our native speakers of Spanish feel the same way. There are students that are out there trying to learn their language. They want to be able to help you in whatever way that they can. So go to that native speaker. It's especially important. I do have a native speaker friend who does videos. For me, the next one down, watch video and answer questions. I lean those more toward my upper level students because I'm going to him as a native speaker who is not a language teacher. So sometimes he's not great at uh, tempering his vocabulary, whereas Nelly is also a teacher. And if you can catch those teachers who are native speakers for your level one and two classes, it's awesome because they know exactly what students at the level one and two levels know. Um, I also have students read and answer questions as interpretive assessments. So it might be an article. This is where things like Martina Bex's El Mundo en Tus Manos or Revista Literal, um, something like KTAL Magazine. These are great ways to have students read and answer questions that you really don't have to prep something extra uh, if you find something that goes along with your unit or with your structures. Another little reading assessment that I do in groups, and this came from our friend Todd Hanlon, Ale, Ali, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing your name wrong, um, on Facebook. He's in our Facebook Fluency Matters Comprehension Based Readers Facebook group. Todd said that, you know, running dictation is great, but 
in running dictation, um, students are running out and memorizing and coming back in and writing down a little simpler way to do it. He said he just makes those like take one please strips, you know, like need a babysitter, take one phone number. Uh, these take ones. So each one of the things you see on the locker has the answers to a question. And students have, I put three students in a group. One is the runner who will go out and rip the strip. One of them is the reader who will read the questions. And one of them is the gluer. So the reader and the gluer really work together. The student brings in the answer. The reader and the gluer try to figure out which question it answers, and they glue the answer to the question that is being answered. They know this is a formative assessment. Like it's a comprehension check. Uh, at the end, if they have an answer that doesn't go with the question, they know they have something wrong, so they have to adjust things as they go. It's quick and easy for you to check. And plus, since they're in groups of three, instead of grading 30 papers, now you only have to grade 10 quickly. Um, I give them a five point or completion grade for getting this done, and they've done it in a group. So it's a great way to get through that story one more time, to get one more rep and review. Um, and it can be a formative assessment. Things don't have to formally be writing on paper to be considered a little formative assessment. I sometimes start with centers and in those centers I can do a little reading assessment. So what these guys are doing is reading some information about going zero waste before we started the zero waste unit. So it's kind of an interpretive way to see what they know and understand before we even get started in this unit of study. So interpretive is awesome and I love to build in those opportunities to get grades as interpretive. But I also like to build in lots of opportunities to produce as they become ready to do that. They really want to fly. So let them retell, maybe on paper, maybe on Flipgrid, maybe you give them the option of paper or Flipgrid. Maybe you let them tell to a friend, tell to a stuffed animal, tell on Flipgrid, tell directly to you. Um, I don't know how you wanna set it up, but they're giving them choice, helps them feel more comfortable and you know that their presentation, because they've chosen how they want to do it, it becomes the effective filter is lower and it becomes a more realistic representation of what they can do in the language. I'd ask you as you consider these assessments and evaluations to re-examine the things that you're doing as far as projects and presentations in your class right now. What I found was, I read an article a long time ago about a lady who was a history teacher and she called it, you know, what are your Grecian urns? She said in her history class, she had devoted a week of time to this project where they actually paper mache a Grecian urn. And as she'd started to go back and reevaluate her curriculum, she realized what were students taking away from that project? Like it was a week long commitment to making a Grecian urn. And while they did have some beautiful artworks when they were done, what were they learning about history? Like, where did this fit in her goals for the curriculum? And I looked at my own projects at that time. And one thing that I was doing when we studied houses, uh, you know, this was textbook day. So we were doing rooms, the house and furniture. I was giving three solid class days with a piece of poster board for students to look at a house book plan, house plan book and draw their house plan, label their rooms and put in all the furniture. But just having all those vocab words in isolation was not doing anything to advance their proficiency. So really, those were three days of class time I was completely throwing away. And I had to re-examine re that project. So now I tend to try and come up with projects or assessments or uh, things, stair steps, scaffolds that lead toward the final maybe assessments. Uh, as I go through the unit that are really better uses of class time. So this is one of the steps at the very beginning, I showed you that circle the wagons where they were sitting in a circle where they were gonna hold up the pictures and they were gonna talk about them and give details. This is one of the stair steps that I gave as a formative leading up to that. I hung those exact same pictures in the hallway and I gave each student a little stack of post-it notes and they had to go around and look at the pictures and write a detail about what they saw in the picture. Now they, when they came, so this is Olivia, she's come to this picture 
as you can see, there are already seven post-it notes hanging. So she has to look at them and add a new detail that isn't on any of those post-it notes. So if you get to the poster early, you get to make the simple things. If you get to it a little later, then you have to give a little bit more detail. So they had to go hang four to five post-it notes in the hallway on these pictures. Oh, whoops, let me go back for a second. Uh, there we go. Um, so after all of them have hung their post-it notes, then we do like a gallery walk where they just walk picture to picture and read the final details that were added. Now can you see how this is getting them ready for that circle the wagons? So if they do well at this and I go around and I look and I see a lot of different details, then I know they're ready for circle the wagons. If we come to this and the students can't think of what to write, then I know we're not quite there yet. We need to go back and we need to talk more about the pictures. Um, so this is a production, this is a written production, but it's really at the sentence level. And then it's going to be at the sentence level and circle the wagons. But then I want them to combine those sentence level utterances when they do their final assessment, which would be to pick a picture and just really discuss what they are seeing in that picture. Oh, now I'm just going backwards. Sorry about that. This is another one of the assessments that I do today that I didn't do in the past, elevator pitches. So when we finish our unit of study on plastics in the ocean, the whole point of studying plastics in the ocean is so that my students can have an opinion about plastics, about ocean plastics, like tell me why I should not use single use plastics. So I have them design a t-shirt. They design their t-shirt and then their final presentation is to tell me about that t-shirt, like what's the message of the t-shirt and why should I give up single use plastics? They practice together in class. I have them choose a partner. So this is Melissa and Abby. Melissa and Abby each presented to each other in the classroom, just low stress. Then they went to the hallway with their iPads and Flipgrid and Melissa recorded Abby doing her presentation. And then they traded and Abby recorded Melissa on Flipgrid doing her presentation. I want them to step up. This is level three. So I want them to step to the next level after everyone has recorded, then I have them sit down with their iPads and they go through and they watch two presentations. They watch them and listen, and then they ask a follow-up question on each of the two presentations. After everyone's watched two and asked two follow-ups, I have them go back into their own presentation, listen to the follow-up questions, and reply. So now we're becoming a little more interpersonal where they have to actually actually be able to interpretively listen, but also form what they're going to say in response. Uh, this is an assessment that I do related to a reader that we read in class. Uh, we read the Frida Kahlo novel by Christy Placido. And when we read that, uh, it's all about the whole unit of study. This is in level four. We've talked about the selfie and what the selfie is today and what the selfie used to be historically, uh, what Frida's selfies were like, because Frida painted all of her defects and we go for that perfect selfie. So um, this is actually a project directly from the teacher's guide. And in the teacher's guide, it showed me how to reduce the resolution of the selfie. So it's basically just an outline on the page. I took a picture of each kid. Um, I gave them this like faded out version of themselves and they were able to use that then to make a work of art uh, that they use to tell me all kinds of stuff about their own identity. Um, so it's an oral presentation in this case where they're just really telling me about themselves and what they see when they look at themselves, um, what others they what they believe others see when they look at them. It's a, it's a whole different way to look at a presentation. Instead of standing in front of the class and presenting about a country that they've researched, trying to dig deep into things that help students use language in ways that are interesting to them. Evaluate the presentations that you're already doing. How could you add an interpersonal element? So this is uh, one of my level four students uh, has done an infographic on narco trafficking. Um, this actually came as a, as a response to some things that we had been doing current events that were in the news and they wanted to know a little bit more about narco culture. And so Kara Jacobs has a unit on narco culture and I pulled things from that unit that um, I wanted to use 
with my unit of study. And we just talked about what the reality is in Mexico with the drug cartels. And then I let them kind of do it. This was level four. So I let them do sort of a genius hour exploration into one of the topics uh, that interested them the most and then create an infographic. I'm going to tell you a secret about infographics. If you look at this, this is a five paragraph essay. But instead of calling it an essay, I called it an infographic. And I said they needed to have five main points that they described really well on their infographic. So I've tricked them. It really lowers the effective filter to think that they're doing this infographic because they're thinking about the images and how they're going to portray this to their class. But what I'm really having them do is write at the essay level. And, you know, even in level four, and especially in level four, when you've been in an input-based classroom, I have students who are still performing at that novice, high, intermediate, low level. And I have some that are now performing all the way up at intermediate, high level. So the ability range is vast, but they can all express their opinion about a particular topic in some way. So uh, what I added for the interpersonal element, and Sharon Birch had this idea, and I just loved it. She had her students do gallery style presentations. So half of the class displays whatever their product is. The other half are basically art gallery patrons, and they walk from poster to poster listening to the presentations. Sharon said she walked around with a meat and cheese tray and some sparkling grape juice and automatically you can evaluate all of those different students who are presenting as you're feeding and giving them grape juice and they've totally forgotten why you're there. Now they're focused on the fact that you're just serving them food and drinks. I loved the idea and it has been a huge success in my classroom as I do these projects. So I have them not read the poster, I have them summarize what they learned to the person that's listening. The person that's listening then has to ask two follow-up questions and the presenter needs to answer them. As I'm feeding and grape juicing them, I get to hear all of these answers and it's super easy and fun. Uh, so this is just a picture of one of the girls that is demonstrating her or showing us her infographic and then answering some questions about it. I think probably the key to assessing with finesse, no matter what level, is to help your students know where they want their proficiency to go. Do they want to earn your state's sale of literacy? Do they want to just have like a basic working fluency? Do they just want to do the bare minimum to make it on your assessment? If you post some proficiency descriptors on my Teachers Pay Teachers, I have a printable set of proficiency descriptors. Um, if you're watching this webinar and you've made it all the way through here to this point, please just email me and tell me that you'd like the descriptors and I will send them to you for free because you deserve a cookie right now. Um, help students know where they want their proficiency to go. Point out where you feel like the majority probably should be now, making sentences, and where you'd like to see them go through the course of this next school year. Don't set immediate, like by the next assessment, I want you all to be writing in paragraphs. That's not going to happen. We can't weigh the pig that often. But if you say by the end of the year, we're in level three, we should be making good paragraphs at the end of the year. Like you should be able to put together a pretty consistent uh sentences grouped into a simple paragraph. You know, maybe that intermediate, low, intermediate, midline is where we want to be for the bulk of the class. Some are going to be high flyers, but everybody I kind of want there. Just kind of let them know what your goals are to help them move toward them. And for me, it's that seal of literacy. In Illinois, our seal of literacy bar is set really high. Uh, we have to have an intermediate high, which is an I-5 on the Apple. Um, it is a five on the AP uh, to get that, maybe a four or five on the AP in Illinois. But to get that seal of literacy, they have to score some pretty high scores. And so that's our goal in the classroom, to earn some kind of award from the state or even from the global seal of literacy. Um, global seal of literacy also has two levels. Um, once they know that that's where they want their proficiency to go, then they follow those descriptors and try to uh, build their performance up to that level on every assessment. And I told you earlier that I would show you one of the ways that I do that. When you get to those high flyers and you really want to differentiate instruction for them, how do they go? If everybody can make it to intermediate low by the end of level four, that beats that national average to have everybody up there. Um, 
but I know that some, the strong mid, you know, the strong middle processors may be lapsing up into the intermediate mid. And I have some that are now high flyers and intermediate high. I got a scaffold a little bit. I made this little bucket and these are also on my TPT. It's called Enriquecete, enrich yourself. I had some enrichment words. I made a hundred of them and I laminated them and I keep them in a basket. When we write, they call them the fancy words and they go get the fancy word basket. And these ones that really want to outperform the performance they did last time, their goal is just to be better than themselves. They can grab the enrichment vocab and they can find a few words that they want to use. A lot of times I tell them don't use more than two or three because you don't want it to be clunky with transition words. But a lot of times they'll pick maybe six or five to keep you know, around them because they don't know what exactly will fit in and they just try and work in the ones that they can. Oh, tomorrow's my birthday. I just got a happy birthday reminder. Uh, so... This is them working with their enrichment structures, and that's a great way to differentiate for those high flyers. Just be their cheerleader. Instead of everything being, um, who said it? Maybe Jason Fritz. During IFLT last week, we did a panel with Actful, and Jason said that he wants evaluation to be a celebration, not you know, an evaluation, really. Not that all the things that are wrong with what you've done. This is the celebration of what you've done right. So that's what I would encourage in your assessment. Find ways to cheer for them, to make them feel good about what they're doing in your classroom, to make them feel successful because nothing motivates them to continue like success. That's a Carol Gob right there. Nothing motivates like success. We want to keep them uh, in our classroom for as long as we can to create a nation of advocates. I'm just quoting everybody, name dropping Grant Boulanger, nation of advocates. We can't advocate for our program unless we have students that feel really successful in our program. We can't see diversity in our programs unless we are trying to reach all students and not just that top 1% who tend to traditionally be white female students that stay in for all years of uh, language class. So let's really try to bring everybody up there and let's get out there now and kick some assessments. Thank you so much for spending this time with me. I hope that this has answered some questions about the way that I assess in the classroom and that it helps you get some ideas for how to assess and really finesse those assessments to show what students can do. Have a really great end of summer. Uh, if you're watching this way later, have a great school year. Um, and I hope to see you out at conferences this year. And if you are interested in training for your district teachers, my email is senoracmt at gmail.com. Um, my blog is somewhere to share.com. Uh, just contact me and we'll see about bringing some training straight to your school. Thank you so much. Bye bye.